Welcome to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I speak with photographer Spencer Lowell. Spencer has worked with clients such as National Geographic, Wired, Time, GQ, and Golf Digest, to name a few. In this interview, I speak to Spencer about his early days in photography, working at camera stores and photo labs in the Los Angeles area, and what motivated him to pursue a career in photography. Much of Spencer's work documents the worlds of science and technology, which has allowed him to photograph people such as Mark Zuckerberg, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, as well as shooting cover stories on robotics for National Geographic. Spencer brings a unique perspective and approach to photography, so I was really pumped to get a chance to speak with him about his work and his journey with photography. So I hope you enjoy, and thanks so much for listening. Good to go. All right. Uh, Spencer Lowell, uh, welcome to the podcast, man. Um, crazy year. Uh, how you been hanging in there, man? How, how you been getting through this crazy year everyone's uh, living through, I guess? Uh, you know, ups and downs, but I think, uh, I, you know, I try to look for the positive side and things. And uh, it's it's been a year of uh, getting to spend time with my family that, um, you know, I have young kids and uh, I, I usually travel quite a bit, so it's it's been it's been nice to be home with them and to be home with my wife and to just be be home. Uh, a lot of a lot of time together, a lot of cycling, which you know, as my work has gone busier, uh, you know, I haven't been able to ride my bike as much, yeah. and uh, it's been nice to be back on the bike with some other photo friends, mainly. <laughs> That's uh, good, man. That's good. Um, yeah. And like, I know setting this up, it sounds like you're kind of finishing the year pretty strong. I think the last couple of weeks is that you've been uh, been shooting some assignments and kind of finishing up pretty strong, I guess, for the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, December is definitely the busiest month I've had this year since March. Um, so that's that's been nice. Um, yeah, the, the, the kind of nature of my projects has shifted this year uh, a lot more almost all in Los Angeles, which is not uh, typical. So it's been nice to kind of work close to home and have productions be a little smaller and a little scrappier and, and kind of just simplify things as much as possible. And, and uh, yeah, it does, it does seem like things are, you know, people are adapting and figuring out how to, you know, how to create content that the need hasn't really gone anywhere. It's just, you know, yeah. Things have had to be put on hold. Yeah, definitely, man. And an interesting thing, like looking about at your work is cool because you do portraiture, but then you also do, I don't know if you'd call it architecture work, but it's a lot of like spaces and kind of, I would say architecture, right? Or would you describe it differently, I guess? Um, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm like a traditional, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm a traditional portraitist or yeah. architect, architectural photographer or still life photographer. I, um, you know, the, the photographers that I've always looked up to the most, um, you know, the, the pinnacle being like Irving Penn, uh, haven't really stuck in any one genre. And uh, I feel like the common thread is, is the, um, you know, is, is their, their style and their fingerprints and whether it's, you know, whether like someone like Penn is shooting, you know, in studio or shooting, you know, still lifes, portraits, anything you could tell it's an Irving Penn photograph. And, you know, I'm not comparing myself to Irving Penn, but that's definitely something that I've, I've always strived for. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to kind of put myself in a corner. So uh, yeah, I, I do tend to jump around a lot and I tend to work on projects where there is a little bit of, of everything. Um, I, I think having that versatility has definitely helped me uh, a bit. Yeah, no, I really liked it because it's like a hard thing to do. Like I know, like at least for myself, like trying to like edit all your work so it's like digestible because you're at the end of the day, you're doing it as living and you're trying to find clients. So it's like, I always struggle with that. I mean, like in terms of like editing your work, how do you kind of approach it since you shoot so much different stuff, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I've always had the intention of, of uh you know working uh editorially uh commercially 
just just you know being uh, a gun for hire, working on commissions. Uh, I, I love the co collaborative nature. I love that you know it's not so much about me and about my you know my own feelings and my own interpretations, uh, but it's you know it's it's a common goal that I that I'm working on with other people. So. You know, I've been lucky enough to start working, uh, you know, pretty, pretty soon out of college. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I haven't had to do too much editing of my own work. Um, and so, you know, I let the project dictate what I'm, you know, looking to accomplish. And, uh, and then, you know, it's kind of up to the client at that point to kind of pull together what they're looking for. Um, but, you know, I, I have been, I've had the intention of, of uh, making a book of my work. I have about, you know, 12 years of projects that I've worked on. A lot of them have been commissioned, but a lot of them have been, uh, you know, pitches that I've given to magazines or projects that I've working on, I've worked on myself. Um, and so I have, you know, I have this, uh, body of work that I've been trying to edit down into a book for a while now. And I've definitely made some progress this year, more so than in past years, just because of having the time. But, you know, it is, it is, uh, it is a challenge. I have, you know, 12 years of work, uh, kind of funneled down to about 700 pictures right now. And I'm really in the process of trying to figure out like, what is the, you know, the story I'm in. You know, I have I have some sense of it, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a whole other beast for me. Yeah, definitely, man. And, and in terms of book stuff, are you someone? Are, are you a big collector of photo books? And do you do you kind of look at a lot of other work yourself to find inspiration, or just kind of just kind of look at other stuff? Or you kind of just kind of focus on your own thing usually? Yeah, I mean, I I have a decent sized collection of photo books, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm a fanatic. Um, before I went to college, you know, I, I took a couple of years uh, off after high school because I, I had already been shooting a little bit. Um, and I, you know, was working in camera stores and photo labs uh, from, from, you know, a young age, as soon as I could get a job. And, uh, and so I knew I wanted to be a photographer, but I, I also wasn't ready to make the commitment to go to college. Um, and so I, I was lucky enough to have a father that, uh, you know, told me any books related to anything I wanted to learn, uh, he would be happy to purchase for me. So, I, you know, I took, awesome. <laughs> I, I, I took advantage of that to a point. And, you know, it's always you know, we, we get, we add a couple books a year to our collection, but, you know, I know some, some people are, are very fanatical about their, their collections, but, you know, I, I, um, I, I am not the best at, um, you know, looking at other photographers. It, it's always been just a little discouraging, like from the beginning, it's, uh, I guess, as I've gotten older and, and deeper into my career, like it's, 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 has uh, a different feeling. I, I'm I'm not as um, you know scared to look at other photographers because I've I've kind of come further down the path. At first, it was it was almost overwhelming. Like, how do I get from here to you know to where Gursky is or to where you know Jeff Wall is or to where Taryn Simon is or you know I, I always look at like fine art photographers, even though I, I knew that I wanted to work commercially and. So, um, you know, I tend to not look too closely, but, um, you know, I definitely do find inspiration in other photographers and, uh, and just other artists, like in, in all genres, anyone who's, you know, kind of reaching the, you know, the limits of their potential is, is inspiration to me. And so I, I look for those people in, in any form that I can find them. Yeah, definitely, man. I feel the same way. And it's something I've just been thinking about a lot lately. Like you kind of mentioned it, like kind of comparing yourself to other people and with like social media, it's like, it, it's the worst, man. Like I, you, you can do it on a daily basis. And I'm almost envious of you, dude. I was looking at your Instagram and you're smart, man. You hardly, it doesn't look like you really don't use it. You don't follow anybody and you don't really <laughs> post that much on there. And it's like, some days I feel like I want to do that. Cause it's just like, on one hand, I love interacting with the other photographers, but like you said, it can just kind of be like a real mind fuck of this, like comparing yourself to what other people have accomplished and what they're doing. Which is, yeah. kind of, I think that's someone trying to do more of like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just like 
I don't know, maybe we just need to get more confidence or something, or I do, I don't know. This I mean, well, social media is engineered to, to make us feel less than so that we continue to look for more. And, you know, we will inevitably look for more in social media. It's like an endless loop. And that's one of the reasons that I, I've been very reluctant to like engage with it. And I've gone back and forth a few times, like just yeah. out of feeling that I, that I have to be present. Um, and every time I do, I just inevitably just, uh, give up. I mean, I, I, I never got on Facebook and I just remember being a kid and my, my grandfather, <clears throat> we kind of had this thing where, you know, he told me at a young age that nothing is free. And so every time I'd see him, like, I would try to think of things that were free, like, you know, air is free. And he's like, well, no, you got to pay your taxes so that we have, you know, the EPA and we could have, you know, clean it. So it was, it was like a, just an ongoing thing I had with him. And that's, that's something that I have kind of uh, you know, always thought about in relations to social media. And that's something that I think a lot more people are becoming aware of these days is that, you know, it's, it's not free because we aren't the users, we're the product and, yeah. and, you know, and, and everything that kind of came to light with Cambridge Analytica at, during the last election in 2016 and, and realizing that it actually is, you know, a, a tool that has a lot of beneficial uses, but, at the same time can very easily be used for evil. And I, you know, I just don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify uh, how beneficial it is to your career. And so I, you know, I have moments where I just, just decide like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And then other times where I'm like, I need to be on here. So it's, it's a, it's a constant struggle, but as far as like looking at other people on social media, I mean, yeah, I think it's it's designed to make us feel like, you know, we're not doing enough. <laughs> and it's just such a time suck. I've like, it, it's like, I've noticed it like, cause I think back when, like when I was like, it's not even really that long ago. I think about when I had my first cell phone, which was like, I got mine at the end, towards the end of high school. I'm 36. Now I started to get a phone towards the end of high school. And I try to think back. Cause like now it's just like, the cell phone is just such a time suck. And it's just like, I feel like every year I have like worse and worse, like ADD or some shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even reading books, like I, you know, I'll read books on iBooks uh, and, you know, it'll take me a significantly longer amount of time to get through a book than if I have a paperback book, because I I'll just, I'll open my phone with the intention of reading and, you know, 20 minutes will pass by and, be like oh, i'm fucking doing a crossword puzzle now or like <laughs> when did, or you like start googling like, when did this guy die or something yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah exactly. you go down this rabbit hole um uh, but anyways um i guess to go back man like where did you kind of grow up and like how did you kind of initially like pick up a camera yeah so i i grew up in la um you know i was born born and raised here in la um and i um you know, I remember being a kid and having family members be like, oh, give Spencer the camera. Like he, you know, he takes a good picture. And <laughs> I have no idea if like I actually did take a good picture or, if, you know, they they just, uh, you know, wanted to make me feel good or what, what you know, it, it just was something that uh, that did make me feel good. Like, you know, being told that, you know, I was good at doing something and I, I didn't have any uh, you know, inherent, uh, skills, uh, as a child where like, I wasn't gifted in any particular, uh, areas. Um, I was, I was creative. I knew that I, I, I knew that I was creative, but I couldn't draw. Um, you know, I, I, I knew I had a lot of attention to detail anytime I, you know, would color or would doodle or any, anything, uh, you know, that, that didn't take any extreme amount of focus. Um, but I, I couldn't draw. So I figured that I couldn't be an artist. And, you know, I was, I was academically, I was a good student and I, um, you know, I excelled in math and science, but I, I, uh, was not a good student in the sense that like, I, I just, I would absorb a concept, I would understand it. And then I would think, what's the point of continuing to like, you know, yeah learn learn this so i you know I, I didn't think i could become 
a, you know, an, an academic or a scientist or a mathematician. Um, and so uh, basically what happened was uh, I applied to a bunch of jobs in the local mall and I got hired at the Gap um, and I was working in the Gap for about a week, miserable. And uh, retail and, sucks, uh, man. I've been there, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so after the first week at the Gap, I got a call from uh, Ritz Camera One Hour Photo. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And they, they offered me, they offered me a, a job and I, I, I just quit immediately <laughs> at the Gap. And I, I went there and, uh, you know, it was, it was still, that was in the late nineties, like 99 probably. Um, and so, you know, there was, there was still film, like consumer digital cameras were like a two megapixel camera for like $1,500. Yeah. You know, it was like not consumers weren't really purchasing digital cameras and everyone was still shooting film. So I, I, uh, you know, had to sell cameras, but what I really enjoyed doing was, was printing on the frontier machine. And, and I knew nothing. I, I knew, I knew exactly what I was trained to know. And, um, but it, it made sense to me. Like if, like if you, if the photo looks too, you know, too blue, add some yellow to it. And so, you know, I got, I got pretty good at doing that. And then, um, I decided like, you know, I could probably, like, I have some experience, like I could probably make some more money uh, using my experience by like going to another camera store and telling them that I make more money than I actually make and see if they would match it. Like I just was like, you know, kind of stupid 17 year old. And, I like it, man. Entrepreneur yeah. from the get go, man. So, I guess. So I, <laughs> so I went to this place called Studio City Camera Exchange um, and I, I met the owner, uh, Bernie, who he, I think he was in his early 80s at that time, um, his his father had opened the camera store in, in the in 1944, I think, or 45. Um, and I, he ended up matching the pay that I said I was getting, which was a little, I mean, it was a few bucks more than I actually was getting. But, you know, I, I thought I like pulled one over on him and took this job. And little did I know that, like, you know, everyone who worked there was in love with photography and um, you know, he collected cameras and they sold used cameras and um, you know, they didn't process on site, but I, I still worked at the film counter. So I was, you know, still working with people coming in to process their film. And, um, and I, you know, made some friends uh, like there was like a younger generation of people that worked there and then some older guys. And I made friends with some of the younger guys and we would just, go out and shoot slide film and black and white film, just like, you know, around town after work, nothing in particular. And, um, and, and then bring the film in and process it. And then it'd be something to look forward to going into work the next day is like getting the film back and seeing like, Oh, did, you know, did this do anything cool or did, you know, did that do anything cool? And, um, and it just like, I was hooked, man. I was completely, I was completely in love with it from the beginning. And it really felt like something like that I could see myself doing in the sense that like going back to like having that like create creative inkling, um, but an inability to like draw, it kind of filled that need because it is obviously a creative uh, form of expression. And then at the same time, uh, I did have an analytical way of thinking about things and, 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 you know, being interested in math and science, like it also incorporated, you know, those facets of thinking. And so I, you know, I kind of just clicked immediately. I was like, you know, I had no idea how to get from there to like being a photographer, but yeah. like, that was the first thing I had found in my life where I was like, Oh, I could, I could see myself doing this. Like, I don't know how, I don't know anything, but, you know, I could definitely see that happening. And so, um, you know, I, I ended up going from there to uh, A&I, uh, which oh, isn't dude. A &I around anymore. A&I was amazing. I, uh, I lived in L.A. briefly after high school. I used to go to A&I. And that oh, was nice. They, I think they at one point they had like four or five lo locations or yep. something. And like, they sure did. Yeah. Prior to going to A and I, like I had never been to like a, that was like a real professional lab that catered to like yeah. pro professional photographers. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I was 
a customer service representative. Um, so I worked with, you know, mainly with photographers assistants that were coming in for like snip tests um, and, and, you know, just being the go between be, between the photographer, or his, his or her studio and the, the production. And so I, I kind of got like uh, my first glimpse of, you know, what it looked like to be a photographer um, and, and like actually working as a photographer. And I, you know, I get to look at things that were coming through to get processed. And it was, it was, it was really exciting. And, um, and at that time, the, the lab was in the process of being purchased uh, by another lab. And, and I just happened to be in a position where uh, I was offered to manage their Santa Monica location. So I was at that time, I was like 21 years old wow. and I, I was managing the Santa Monica location. And I, I kind of just had this like moment where I realized like, there's not really any room for me to grow here. And um, I, I was shooting, it, it had gone to the point where I was shooting on the weekends, um, like to make a couple bucks that my sister was modeling at that time. So uh, she kind of linked me up with her agency to like just test models because I thought that's what I was supposed to do as a photographer. Like, oh, I take pictures of models and yeah. like flowers and sunsets. Like that was kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was, I was, uh, and, and, you know, I make a few bucks on the weekends doing that and I'd be working and I was, you know, I, I, I had been out of high school for like two or three years at that point and um, was like, fine financially I didn't know like what my ambitions were like for the larger picture but I I realized that like if I wanted to kind of get to the next level like I needed an education whether it was from like assisting or from going to college and um I had I had taken a class at a community college when I was still in high school and I I went uh like mainly to just use the the photo lab and um uh, the lab manager, it was at, it was at Valley college. I don't remember his name, but the lab manager there kind of took a liking to me and, and he kind of, you know, he told me about like the PDM 30 and he told me that like art center was the school to go to. And so, um, when I got to that point in my, uh, in my early twenties where I, I, I wasn't sure what was next, I decided oh, I'll just apply to art center and, uh, That's in, uh Pasadena, right? Yeah, it's in Pasadena. And, and two and a half weeks later, I was in class. It, it all happened like super, super fast. They're like, wow. you know, we've, we've accepted you and the next semester starts in two weeks. And if we can figure out how to like get everything together, you can start next semester. And I was like, I, I felt right. And I, you know, I, I did. It. And, and, uh, and so I studied, uh, I studied art center, um, for, for two and a half years, which I personally feel like I had a very good experience there. It's, it's a commercial school. Um, you know, they're trying to teach you how to be a working photographer, at least in, in the track that I was in. Yeah. Um, and, and it was like, at that point, it was 2005 is when I started. So, um, you know, there, there was a digital basis to the curriculum and, and, you know, creating a digital workflow and, Photoshop and all, all that stuff. So I feel like I, I, I got like the education I needed for the career that I, that I now have, which is pretty, uh, you know, miraculous that it all worked out like that. Um, yeah, because cause, so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Cause like what type of work were you shooting when you're in college? Like, cause were you doing a lot of portrait work or kind of the environmental kind of stuff you do or like, uh, uh, well, I just mean in the sense that like, um, you know, digital, like the first 5D came out like in my second semester that I was in college. So like, yeah. you know, I, I was lucky that I got to have an education, um, you know, that was, you know, timely enough to incorporate the the industry that was so quickly changing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so while I was in college, I... Um, I, at that point, I knew I didn't want to shoot like fashion or models. I didn't really have any interest in, you know, product photography. Um, I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, most of the time I found myself just wandering around with my camera and like looking for pictures. Um, I, I have friends still uh, like one of my really good friends who I started school with uh is is Nicholas Allen Cope I don't know if you you know his work but 
he's someone who like just goes into a studio and or even yeah he he will just like create these beautiful photographs out of nothing and uh you know that that was how he was in college and and for me personally like the idea of starting with nothing scared me like i prefer going out into the world and and having uh having different ingredients that i can that i can pull together and and create something but you know i had no idea how i was going to turn that into a career um and in retrospect there there really would have been no way for me to like formulate uh you know a plan um but things just kind of worked out um in my my last semester i i took a printmaking class and it was like silk screening and um you know etching all, all sorts of different uh like printmaking processes uh that were like for any major in the college to take and the teacher took a liking to me uh tony zapeda um and and he uh allowed me to come in um after hours and make platinum palladium prints wow. uh he helped he helped me figure out how to like you know mix all the chemistry and and uh and so i don't know if you're familiar with the process but you you basically paint the emulsion onto the paper and and um and he cuz he probably because he wasn't a photography teacher but also just because of who he was he was like um you know stop fucking trying to figure out how to make money like how to make a career how to make money how to like you know cuz for me it, you, you know going to college it was so expensive i was like i got to figure out how to like make a lot of money and how to be very successful and like you know what am i going to do i don't know what you know i was kind of spinning out especially it being like my last semester there and yeah. he was just like just do something you're interested in like don't fucking worry about making money and you know i've always i went to space camp as a kid i've uh you know like i said i was good in math and science and but i've always had a fascination with with space and so um i found out that like the hubble space telescope imagery is public domain and you could just download like high resolution files and so i downloaded these uh these you know files of uh of nebulae and uh it, and basically made sheets uh at a lab like mat like 16 by 20 like negatives basically uh i actually made them as positives and then i printed them as negatives wow. uh so so it looked it almost looked like someone like splattered ink onto a, a canvas but it was you know these these images of of matter being formed in space and that was something that i thought was kind of interesting i i i thought you know this is uh you know an a- areas in space where matter is being created being represented by like a motion on a paper that looked like you know art was being created um and so i i um decided i would put some of those prints up in my in my grad show um and i i mix them up with a couple of my photographs and just out of a stroke of fate um this 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 guy by the name of Dan Goods who is uh his title is a visual strategist at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory wow. uh came came to the grad show and and JPL is 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 a stone throw from Art Center and he actually went to Art Center um but uh you know he he and I started talking that night and he invited me up for a tour of of JPL and um you know I, i went for a tour and you know was completely taken away uh, you know there that's where they build all of the like the mars rovers they build there and like any kind of uh you know spacecraft meant for you know satellites meant for exploring other planets um and so you know i i was lucky that he offered me a job like right almost immediately um he was working on a couple different projects that were like we have to shoot portraits of some of these scientists for this installation and we need like photographs and a bunch of these labs for like a new website that they were working on and and so it was really just like it kind of uh coalesced the type of shooting that I had been doing in school where it was like you know we'll just give you a 
a, uh, you know, a badge so you can kind of scan yourself into any building and just like wander around and take pictures. And wow, that's um, fucking crazy. That's crazy to hear stuff like that. Like I remember I, I got an assignment for iRobot one time, which is based in Massachusetts uh-huh. and they're like, they didn't let you shoot shit. <laughs> they're like, you can shoot in the lobby and like, yeah. bit, that's amazing. You got this got freedom, just kind of roam around and shoot all that technology. Yeah. I mean, obviously it didn't open every door, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It, it's it's a it, it's a public uh you know it's it's public domain it's mm-hmm. it's uh you know it's 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 a lot different in the private sector trust me yeah. I, I i have plenty of people tell me no now <laughs> <laughs> you know um but but basically i you know i worked there um for the first like three three to six months out of college um and you know it was i didn't have a house i didn't have a wife i didn't have kids like you know i i i was able to like make enough money off of that to like get by and uh and and more importantly though it gave me a body of work uh that i could use to kind of steer my career from there and um you know i i mixed up a lot of the images that i shot at jpl with you know my my photography from college and i just started presenting myself to different magazines that i could see myself working with like discover uh wired uh time you know a lot of ma- any magazines that kind of had a you know a, a science and technology kind of slant to them um and and slowly but surely like one thing led to the next and you know the work has really developed on its own since then but it it really was like that, that luck of having Dan, which is so funny because he's someone who I still am very close with and I still, uh, you know, work with. We, we were just emailing yesterday actually about a project. So it's, it's, uh, it's lucky that we kind of met each other that night. And yeah, it's someone I have a lot of gratitude for. And when you're starting out and you're just trying to get your name out there and you're trying to get your first clients and stuff like that, um, did you kind of ever have times of kind of like doubting yourself, like if this career would work out or did you kind of always, always have that like confidence that you would be able to succeed and get this? Cause it's like, I mean, when you first start out, no one knows you are. It's, it, it is tough. It is, it is mental gymnastics, at least for myself, man. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's both of those feelings like on any given day, even today, you know, 12 years into my career, like, you know, it's, it's not like you, you make it and then you're set for life. You know, it's, it's a constant uh, process of, of, of discovering like who you are as an artist and, and like what you have to say and how you're going to share that with other people and and where you want to focus your energy and, and yeah, doubt is like just a part of that. And, and, and so is, you know, uh, belief in, in yourself. Like it's, it's, it's something that, you know, is just always kind of there. I think it's, it's more in the background now. Like when I, when I first started, obviously like those, those voices of doubt, um, were overwhelming and, you know, it really took, uh, you know, the, the, um, attention of of other people to like silence those voices and 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 now it it's 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 a lot more in the background and and i have some uh you know sense of peace in the fact that like you know yes i still need to keep working and keep creating and keep evolving um but you know it's going to be okay. And as, as long as I, as long as I keep myself busy yep. um, and, and keep, keep creating things uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter like what, I, what my goals are, what my desires are like things, things will just happen. And that's something my dad is, my dad's a musician. He was never able to, to make a career out of it. Um, but even to this day, he is constantly in his studio just, recording because it's it's something he can't not do Mm -hmm. um and that's that's you know that's something that i've always had a lot of respect for and something that i i try to apply to my own you know my own process is is that like you know it's just something that i need to get out um and and i'm i'm lucky that i have like a a format to get that out i think it, it helps me stay sane or 
less insane. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's actually one thing I was going to ask. I'm always just curious. I mean, I'm sure you know this feeling like maybe you'll have a week or two where you don't have an assignment. And those those weeks can be very stressful because you're like, am I ever going to work again? When's the next assignment coming? Like, how do you utilize those that downtime if you do have a week where you don't have an assignment? Like, how do you kind of utilize that time? Is it just kind of marketing or shooting new work? Or how do you kind of, like you said, make sure you can kind of don't go insane and kind of keep the train on the tracks, I guess, on those slow weeks, I guess. Yeah, I mean, over the years, it's 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 a combination of of different things, like like you said, uh, you know, marketing, um, you know, pitching. Like I, I I try to pitch a lot of different projects. So, you know, if if it's something that I I really want to shoot, um, you know, I'll I'll figure out like who would be a good person to shoot it for and try to you know try to put ideas forward to you know, some of, some of my clients, um, you know, these days it's been, like I said, it's been editing a book, um, that, that is occupying a lot of my time. Um, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I, I think finding things that aren't, aren't photography also is, is helpful. Um, you know, riding, the, riding to, that bike, just, right? Yeah. Riding the bike, you know, reading, um, spending time with my, with my family, um, you know, all of those things, you know, I used to think were separate from, you know, the, the process. And, and these days I, I feel like they're just an extension of it because, you know, they, they keep, they keep my cup full and they allow me to like have something to offer, um, you know, my, my artwork. And, and so, you know, I, I think it's important that like, I do allow myself to kind of step back and, um, you know, and just recharge. Uh, so yeah, but it, you know, it's all, it's all of the above. I mean, there's always, there's always something to do this year, obviously has been a bit of an anomaly, Yeah. but I've, you know, I've been allowing, allowing myself to, you know, semi non-permanent retirement vibes. <laughs> just <laughs> Yeah, like, man. I kind of have to remind myself too, because like as you know, we're both freelance guys, and you're always just hustling to find the next gig. But it's but it's I like I like you said, I, I gotta remind myself, man. Like sometimes it's okay to slow down and like enjoy your life, like you know, yeah, do something. It's just like obviously hustle, hustle, hustle. But like I don't know, you can wear yourself out. So that's something I've just been trying to remind myself this year. Um, but you know, one thing like looking at your work, I was really excited to talk to you about. Um, you you've been lucky enough to shoot like all this cool robotic stuff. Um, what is it about like the robotics and that type of work, uh, that you enjoy shooting and what have you kind of learned from getting the glimpse of some of these amazing technologies, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, so my, my take on photography, um, is that it's, it's, you know, a, a means for me to share information with other people. Um, and I, I think about the scientific pro the scientific process a lot in relation to like my approach to photography um and you know you form a hypothesis um in in the case of you know photography for me it's like i i will pre-visualize uh you know what i think i'm gonna do uh based on like where i'm going who i'm meeting what i'm shooting uh so i'll, I'll form a hypothesis i'll get i'll get to the shoot i collect data you know I take the pictures, same thing, collecting data, bring it back to the lab to process it, uh, similar to, to what a scientist would be doing once they've collected their data. And then I share my results. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I've always taken that as, as my approach and I found that to be the most rewarding, uh, you know, reason for me to, to take pictures is like, it's it's about it's about sharing and for me i want to share things that i find to be interesting or i find to be important and and so you know I, that's always been like from the beginning once i you know once i got into my career and realized that it it, it could be it's, it's science and technology um and and so you know there obviously robotics is is a huge part of like our current uh, uh, our, our current point in science and technology and, and kind of where things are headed. And, uh, as, as, you know, things evolve, uh, 
you know, the technology that will enable robotics to be a part of our life will just continue to, to become more prevalent. Um, and so, you know, this, this past year and particularly, I worked on a big story for National Geographic um, on like the current state of robotics. Um, and I got to travel you know, all over Europe and Japan and the U.S. and um, and kind of just have like this overarching look of uh, where things stand uh, in in the robotics industry. And you know, it's uh, it's it's it, it's incredible. I mean, I personally am of the mindset that like you know, the universe started off as particles and particles evolved into atoms and atoms into chemicals and chemicals into biology. And now biology is, is evolving into technology and that it's all part of the same system. And that, um, and that you know, robotics is, is, is just go going to be an extension of, of our humanity. And I, I personally, I'm not scared of it. Um, I, I do think that like as a species, we're gonna have to learn to uh, adapt um, to a completely different world. I mean, we've seen that with, you know, automation taking over jobs and, yeah. you know, in the labor industry and as, you know, uh, artificial intelligence continues to evolve as it inevitably will, um, you know, a lot of different industries are, are going to be obsolete and so we're we're gonna have to figure out as like as a society how you know how to adapt to a lot of the problems that will arise but at the same time like a lot of problems will be solved by the technology so it's yeah. it's a give and take and and yeah and getting to go into you know these environments and spend time with these technologies and talk to the people that are developing them uh, is is an honor and and I I feel uh, lucky that I get to um, to kind of share what I'm what I'm seeing with other people and and hopefully do it justice. I mean you know my my goal is to to you know not only you know share things but share them in a way that is you know exciting and engaging and and hopefully highlighting the aspects of, of the content that I find to be the most uh, interesting. Um, and so that's always, you know, a fun problem to, to solve is like how to tell the story and how to tell it in a, you know, a nice voice. Yeah, definitely. It is interesting. I, you know, I've read a lot about robotics and like, you know, I know listening to Andrew Yang, who was running for president last year, he talked yeah. a lot. That was kind of the the heart of his campaign was how about all yeah. these jobs are going to be obsolete and like, you know, truck drivers aren't going to be with truck drivers anymore because they're going to be automated trucks. So it's like, yeah, like you said, it's a give and take, but you, you think at the end it'll be, a, it'll be a net positive for us, you think? I mean, I, I, I have to think so. I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I guess it's possible. Um, I, I definitely think that a big part of it's go going to be some type of intervention in the distribution of wealth, because that seems to be like the biggest problem, but I, I'm not a politician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't have, I don't have the answers. I just know that like, you know, we have the resources and, you know, the technology is going to just continue to get better and you know a lot of the problems that the industrial age has created i i believe the technology will be able to solve but but it's only if you know greed doesn't get in the way i guess yeah no that's incredible um and yeah yeah like how do you approach yeah the, with the nat geo stuff was that like a thing that you pitched to them or they came to you for that or like how did that kind of all come together for you um how did that one come together um I, I think I pitched that that was with uh, Kurt Mulcher was, was the robot story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think I pitched something else to him and it was just around the time that he was uh, putting this robot story together. And he, he asked me if I, if I wanted to work on the story with him and it, it, it was very organic. I, um, you know, I've, I've done a couple projects with Nat Geo, but this was definitely, it was, it was my first cover. So it was, it was very extensive and they have a much different way of working than most magazines. I mean, 
you know, they're, they're using all of their budget on um, giving the photographers as much time as possible to shoot as much content. So it's like, you, you know, they're paying for, they're, they're using their money for travel and for, you know, shoot days. So, you know, I probably shot between 20 and 30 days for like one story, which would be unheard of at any other magazine. Yeah. Um, but granted the, the production is, is much smaller. So, you know, I'm not going to have a huge crew with me. I'm not going to have, you know, a, a studio full of equipment. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, work a little harder uh, on the front end, but, you know, spend more time. Yes. Uh, think time, time. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah, time is the, yeah. uh, as you know, a lot of these assignments, you don't get any time. You get sometimes five, 10 minutes to shoot somebody or whatever. And it's just yep. like one day thing. So to have that time to, yeah, cause that's what I heard. Like a lot of some other photographers, like I interviewed Brian Fink and he's yeah. with Nat Geo and he was just saying, yeah, it seems like a much more collaborative um, process with Nat Geo, I guess. Yeah. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's national geographic. I mean, before I knew that, you know, I wanted to be a photographer, like I knew that like being on the cover of national geographic was something to like strive for, you know, it's just, it's like, it's, yeah. it's part of, it's part of our culture. So you know, they open a lot of doors, which, you know, in, in working for them is nice because it does, it does allow you more access and more time. And, um, and so, yeah, so, uh, Kurt and I, we, you know, he, he had all these, uh, places in mind that we wanted to try to get access to, and he worked his ass off to try to, you know, open up doors and, um, and, you know, we collaborated with the writer of the story as well to, Try, try to figure out like what needed to be shot and what might be good to be shot. And, um, and we, we really just, uh, you know, kind of played it by, played it by ear. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, you know, I got to, I got to go to, you know, shoot a robotic priest in Japan uh, that, you know, the, this temple in, in Kyoto, like believes is like a reincarnation of, of the wow. Buddha. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, it sounds kind of kooky, but then you go there and they're like, you know, what, what's the difference between this and a statue? Like it's a statue that can preach basically, but like they believe that it has like a soul to it. Um, so, you know, from something like that to like, you know, being in, in, in like the San Diego area and shooting at a facility that makes sex robots. So it was like, it was a huge spectrum uh, that, that I got to explore and, um, and really understand kind of where things stand. And, and, you know, I, I think we still have a long way to go before we're at like, uh, you know, an iRobot, uh, kind of phase where the robots are, you know, in your are heart. equals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The iRobots is, the iRobots is vacuum, vacuuming in your carpet at this point, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean the, the Will Smith movie, iRobot. Oh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. True. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're still in their infancy, but they're just going to continue to, to evolve and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, yeah, it's really amazing stuff, man. And uh, one thing I was really, one project you did, I was really interested in talking to you about, you, you traveled out, I believe in Japan, the Fukushima, I'm probably going to butcher this, da, Daichi, uh, nuclear, Daichi, yeah. Daichi nuclear plant, which I read was the second worst um, like nuclear disaster since Chernobyl, I believe, which yeah. happened, I think in 2011, um, you went there in 2017. Um, was that a personal project or an assignment or what was that kind of whole experience about? Uh, no, that was, that was actually, uh, commissioned for Wired. Um, and that, uh, was with Amy Silverman. Uh, she was, she was a photo editor at Wired at that time, uh, sent me out there, which I actually, that was like, <laughs> I, I tend to say yes to things as long as I'm available. And, you know, my, my, uh, my morals aren't in question. Like I, I'll say yes to, 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 to things. I just have always believed that that was kind of the right approach. And this was the first one where, you know, my schedule was open, but I actually had to like, think about like, do I want to do this? And, yeah. Cause and the, health, to, the health factor, I would have been nervous. Yeah. Oh hell man. <laughs> yeah. And talk to my, talk to my wife and, you know, and, 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 you know, after doing some research and talking to some some people involved with the project, um, you know, they they assured me that like 
the I would experience more radiation on the flight to Japan than I would experience during the shoot. And yeah. you know, we had we had people with us the whole time. We had Geiger counters with us um, to to you know make sure that we weren't being exposed to more than a healthy amount of radiation in in each day. Um, but it was it was uh, it was eye opening. I mean, I've always believed that you know nuclear energy is is you know better than uh, you know you know burning coal or burning gas um, just because there is no waste. But when there is waste um, or not waste, there's always waste, but it's you know it's contained. But when there's you know uh, contamination like there was in Fukushima. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that, you know, that nuclear is the answer that it's going to solve our problems because it just stopped everything there. I mean, we went into the exclusion zone and it's not like, it's not like, uh, people like packed up and closed shop and like slowly like left. It was like, people just dropped what they were doing and like ran. Um, so like in some of these towns you go into them and um you know the, there's just there's just like cars parked where they were left and you know the businesses are just like left as they were when when the um it it was it was an earthquake that then caused a you know a tsunami yeah, pull it up yeah, yeah. this is like one of the towns so like right here like no one lives here anymore right it's just no no one lives there that particular town um you were allowed to go into um un, unaccompanied but you no one was allowed to live there no businesses were open it's basically like you're allowed to drive through it mm -hmm. um yeah um but then there was another there was another town probably the next yeah that so that town was in the exclusion zone meaning that there was still high levels of contamination yeah um and so we had to have an escort with us that brought us in there and um, and we could only spend a certain amount of time in there before we had too much uh, contamination exposure. So you're, and you, guys, um, and you it, guys are wearing full hazmat suits the whole time you're shooting and everything. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you had to. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then we went into the, the plant and a big part of it was like, you know, Japan has put a lot of effort into the cleanup um, and they really wanted to, you know, highlight how... Uh, safe things are now mm -hmm. um but the fact of the matter is it's like in i think in it, it was either one i can't remember one or two of the reactors like they haven't retrieved the the radioactive cores uh, because right. they they fell through the reactor during the earthquake and they don't you can't like go in there and get them you know so they're they're still figuring out how how to retrieve those cores um and yeah so it was, it was an eye-opening experience, definitely. And, and, um, you know, getting to go into a nuclear reactor is not something I, <laughs> yeah, dude, that I was I, like, I saw that, that I would be doing. <laughs> yeah. It was gnarly, man. Yeah. Cause over quarantine, yeah. I, I watched the Chernobyl documentary that's on HBO. Uh -huh. I don't know yeah, if you yeah. saw it. It was like, at least for me, eye-opening to see, like learn about it and stuff. And I was just like, it was mind blowing, man. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, scary. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I guess in terms of like portraiture, uh, like what's your kind of approach to portraiture? Like when you're photographing people, like, do you kind of have like a, do you go in knowing exactly how you want to execute it? Or do you kind of leave room for yourself to kind of, um, let things happen organically or what's your kind of approach to like photographing people, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll know the, the tone that I, that I kind of want to try to hit, uh, with, with the lighting at least. Um, you know, like, like when I shot Zuckerberg, for example, like, um, it was a story right after the election and, and it was a story for the New York times magazine about how Facebook, uh, like had an effect on, on the election. And it wasn't necessarily meant to capture him in the best light. And so I knew I wanted to do something a little like moodier than what I would normally do. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I had, I had that, uh, in my mind ahead of time. Um, but then as far as like, you know, how, 
how much you can plan as far as like your interaction with the subject uh, that I, I tend to let happen more organically. So, you know, he had like, I can't remember three or four PR people, um, you know, behind, behind the camera when we were shooting. So, you know, it was, uh, it was one of those things where you you're wanting to have an authentic interaction with someone. And when you're shooting someone like, like, you know, yeah. Zuckerberg, um, you know, trying to figure out how do I take a picture differently than, you know, everyone else has. And so I feel like, you know, that was, that was one of those instances where you just, you just kind of have to let it happen. Um, and where the PR people are, were they like saying stuff like, Oh, he doesn't, it, it looks too like, I don't know, dark or it looks too negative because like you said it's a tough article because it's like yeah it's an art it's not like a puff piece about what facebook is at that point so how that must have been kind of challenging because like like you said you're an artist and you have your a perspective but then like you said there's like three pr people yeah yeah i mean um surprisingly they didn't really say anything about like the mood of the image but like if i had if i asked him to pose in any particular way um, he would, you know, check with them or look to them wow. uh, to, to agree or disagree. Like for the shot of him sitting at his desk, you know, I asked if he would like stand and lean against his desk and he like looked at his PR people and they said, no, let's not do that. And so he sat, then he sat in his chair instead. So it's, you know, it's, but uh, I mean, so much of portrait photography is an interaction between the photographer and the subject. I mean, especially when you look at someone like, like Zuckerberg, who's been shot or any celebrity really, who's been shot by so many people, like, you know, every photo is different. Like, you know, my photo of him looks nothing like Leibowitz's photo, looks nothing like Stryber's photo, looks nothing like, yeah. you know, anyone else who's photographed him. So, um, you know, I, I think, um, and I, I don't necessarily consider myself a portrait photographer. I just, I, I uh, consider myself like capable of photographing portraits and, um, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it more now than I did earlier in my career, just because I feel more, more comfortable uh, with, you know, with lighting, but also just, you know, with interacting with people. Um, and so, you know, I, I enjoy the challenge of it, but, you know, personally, like my, my mind is, is always going to like, you know, geometric shapes and like I could go into a space and kind of make sense of a photograph uh, very effortlessly, but with, with people, it's always more of a, uh, a challenge, which I, which I embrace now, but it's, it's, uh, it's just a completely different experience. all yeah. around. Yeah. Cause like, what's your mindset going into a shoot like that with Zuckerberg or, and I think you also shot Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple and obviously going into it, you know, there's going to be a bunch of PR people there and there's a lot more red tape. Like what's your kind of mindset going into a shoot like that? Is it like, cause obviously, like I said, like you, you have an idea in mind what you want to execute, but then there's like red tape. Like how do you kind of navigate and balance, like getting what you want versus not pissing off the PR people and all that. Like, how do you kind of weave through that yeah. craziness? Uh yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something that I, I touched on a, a little bit earlier um, when, I, when I was speaking about like, you know, just being overwhelmed by the thought of starting with a blank canvas. Like I, I personally like constraints. I, I like, uh, you know, having uh, variables that I need to navigate through to get me to an end result. And I, and, and I, and so I, I think about, you know, PR people, uh, and, you know, time and, you know, location and any, any, like any variable that I have no control over, I feel like is just, I, I try to look at it as, as just, a you know, a, a um, like a guide to get me to where I need to be. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I try to embrace, I try to embrace those constraints as much as possible um, and not look at them as, as something that will hold things back, um, but actually like propel, propel the photograph forward. So, you know, if I know that it's something that I 
can't change that I have no control over. Like I can't tell Mark Zuckerberg, you know, to tell his PR people to leave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe maybe someone like Leibowitz can, but <laughs> you know, I I would never think of doing that. And no. you know, I I can't you know I can't ask Tim Cook for like an extra like half an hour. Like you <laughs> yeah. know, he's he's the CEO of like the wealthiest company in the world, and you know, so there's so there's so many variables that just can't can't be changed and and so you know my my approach is to to always embrace those things and and i i think i do that um or at least i try to do that in in kind of all areas of of my career and 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 in my life as well like just you know to help to help get me from where i am to where i need to be like inevitably like there are things that are go going to be out of my control definitely man yeah i really appreciate that. that's a good way to look at it. it's just positive and it's kind of embracing whatever you have in front of you and making the best out of what, what you got. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, a nice. couple more questions. I'll let you go. Yeah, uh, no, appreciate it. Yeah. I, I had to ask, man, one of your shoots, dude, you got to photograph Roger Deakins, man. Legend <laughs> of the fucking game, man. Like how is that? Yeah. I, I feel like going into that shoot, I'd be like self-conscious of my lighting. Cause this dude knows, <laughs> exactly, knows exactly what you're doing. Like, and what, what was that shoot? Like, uh, guess, you're telling me, dude, that was uh... <laughs> That was not only Deacons. That was a, a roundtable photograph for the Hollywood Reporter with like, wow. I think it was like five Academy nominated cinematographers. <laughs> so like, I think I just have the shot of Deacons on my site, but I, you know, I shot a group shot of all of them, um, and it, yeah, it was. I mean, it was fine, but it was it was not uh, it was not the most comfortable pre production. <laughs> like, you know, having all of their voices in my head and you know um but you know hollywood reporter has something very specific that they want to try to accomplish and so you know it's kind of my my job to to you know make that into a reality and um you know for that shoot i decided to light um at least for the group shot uh with with hot lights which i don't usually do but i just figured they might be a little more comfortable if they could actually see the light that they're um that they're being lit with um yeah and and then but as far as like the individual portraits like with deacons he was one of the nicest guys i've ever met and yeah. you know he i don't know he has like a, a website like a blog that he oh, actually he has a, like he has a dope podcast out now it comes out weekly oh like, really yeah let me see if i can find it here i was just listening to it and he has like it, it's it, it's eye-opening he has all different types of people like cinematographers and dps and like location scouts yeah um, i'll look rad. it up and send it to you but it's I, it's really informative and i'll, I'll put it I'll, I'll put in a link when i upload this and people can check it out but yeah he's just that must have been yeah because he's just such a legend of the game you know yeah he's, he's a legend and he's not like He's not trying to like keep any secrets which i i respect a lot like he he wants to share his knowledge and and that was really how he was when when I was shooting him. Like, and and in, in any portrait uh, shoot, like I'm trying to connect with the subject, and it was no different with him. It's just like trying to have a conversation, and you know, and capture moments in between thought. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was a privilege though to get to to meet him and spend yeah. a moment with him. Yeah. And with the portrait stuff, do you kind of like when the subject shows up, do you kind of walk them through like what you're hoping to execute beforehand and kind of give them like, I know some people kind of have like mood boards and stuff like that, or you kind of just do your thing and just let stuff happen, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't ever really have mood boards. I just, um, you know, like I said, I'll have, I'll have my lighting approach, like pretty mapped out ahead of time. <laughs> um, obviously, like if it's someone I have a lot of a little bit of time with I'll, I'll try to have you know a couple setups ready um and then it's and then it's just about like trying to connect with them in some way hopefully like emotionally um in a short amount of time and um you know guide them through the shoot as uh as however i can but uh yeah, yeah. I, I i tend to be more impro improvisational like all around in my approach to, to photography, like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of have things that I know that I will need with me, um, usually more than I actually will need just so I'm, I'm prepared, but, um, you know, it, it then becomes a matter of just, you know, figuring things out while I'm on location or in the studio. Um, obviously if it's, you know, 
a, a commercial job and advertising job, things are mapped out a lot more ahead of time. And, you know, the intention is, is much clearer, but for, for editorial stuff, it's like, you know, you can't help but to just problem solve on the spot. Yeah, definitely. Not. Gonna... No, that's great. And I guess to wrap up, man, like, um, I guess you've been doing this for a while. Like what kind of keeps you inspired with photography and kind of any goals moving into the, the new year? Uh, hopefully in 2021 is a better year for everybody, but uh, <laughs> what's next for you, man? Anything kind of on your, on your target or anything you're hoping to shoot, I guess, moving forward? Yeah. I mean, my big goal is, is this book. Um, you know, I, I really want to like bring it to fruition uh, to get, to get it published. It's uh, you know, I, I, I have I have all of these images up in my studio and you know I know what I want it to be I just need to like you know button up and like actually do it um but you know as far as like other goals for for 2020 I mean I feel like right now more than ever like people need um to be you know exposed to to science and to like facts and to information and you know i i hope that i can help facilitate that transfer of, of knowledge uh you know with with photography in any way that i can and you know i the industry is changing a lot um you know a lot of magazines are, are going away but i think a lot of, of new doors are opening and so i hope that you know, there's, there's still platforms where that, that information can be shared. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, like on a simpler level, like, I hope to travel some more. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I've been, I've been happy to be home and I've been happy to be with my family and I'm super grateful for this time. Um, but, you know, I, I also like thrive on, on, you know, exploring and experiencing like different places on the planet and um it's it's something that i i'm lucky that i get to do as a career and i i definitely look forward to to doing it again i i just i i, I love the whole process of of you know all of it going to the airport and getting to a new place and it's definitely something that has been missing from this year i hear you man well uh spencer yeah. dude it was a pleasure talking to you man mad respect for your work and uh, thanks man yeah good luck with everything in the new year and anybody wants to go check out spencer's work it's just spencerlowell.com and then i think on instagram uh at spencer Lowell underscore i believe uh they can go check out, <laughs> check out more of your, your work man but yeah thanks so much man it's a real pleasure talking to you yeah thank you so much for for asking me to do this it's uh i feel lucky to to be in in good company and i i respect uh like the the capsule that you're creating with your with your interviews so i, I appreciate you. it man well have a good holidays and uh happy new year man all right you too take care so there you have it that was the spencer lowell interview i uh, just want to thank spencer so much for taking the time to come on the podcast it was a real pleasure talking to him about everything he's accomplished within his photography and his approach to everything he does. Uh, just really unique work and his approach to photography is really interesting. Um, so definitely go check out Spencer's work at spencerlowell.com as well as feel free to follow him on Instagram at spencerlowell underscore. I'll put the links in the descriptions, um, but definitely go check out some of his work. It's really interesting stuff. And as always, I'll be having weekly podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as the Photo Banter YouTube page. Um, so definitely go, go over to our YouTube page and hit the subscribe button. It'd be much appreciated. And as always, thanks so much for listening and take care.